Hello and welcome to this lecture. My name is Mumshad Manambet and we are learning Kubernetes for beginners. In this lecture, we will discuss about Kubernetes services. Kubernetes services enable communication between various components within and outside of the application. Kubernetes services helps us connect applications together with other applications or users. For example, our application has groups of pods running various sections, such as a group for serving a front-end load to users, another group for running back-end processes, and a third group connecting to an external data source. It is services that enable connectivity between these groups of pods. Services enable the front-end application to be made available to end users. It helps communication between back-end and front-end pods and helps in establishing connectivity to an external data source. Thus, services enable loose coupling between microservices in our application. Let's take a look at one use case of services. So far, we talked about how pods communicate with each other through internal networking. Let's look at some other aspects of networking in this lecture. Let's start with external communication. So we deployed our pod having a web application running on it. How do we, as an external user, access the web page? First of all, let's look at the existing setup. The Kubernetes node has an IP address, and that is 192.168.1.2. My laptop is on the same network as well, so it has an IP address 192.168.1.10. The internal pod network is in the range 10.244.0.0, and the pod has an IP 10.244.0.2. Clearly, I cannot ping or access the pod at address 10.244.0.2 as it's in a separate network. So what are the options to see the web page? First, if we were to SSH into the Kubernetes node at 192.168.1.2, from the node, we would be able to access the pod's web page by doing a curl, or if the node has a GUI, we would fire up a browser and see the web page in a browser following the address http 10.244.0.2. But this is from inside the Kubernetes node, and that's not what I really want. I want to be able to access the web server from my own laptop without having to SSH into the node and simply by accessing the IP of the Kubernetes node. So we need something in the middle to help us map requests to the node from our laptop through the node to the pod running the web container. This is where the Kubernetes service comes into play. The Kubernetes service is an object just like pods, replica set, or deployments that we worked with before. One of its use case is to listen to a port on the node and forward request on that port to a port on the pod running the web application. This type of service is known as a node port service because the service listens to a port on the node and forward requests to the pods. There are other kinds of services available, which we will now discuss. The first one is what we discussed already, node port, where the service makes an internal pod accessible on a port on the node. The second is cluster IP, and in this case, the service creates a virtual IP inside the cluster to enable communication between different services, such as a set of front-end servers to a set of back-end servers. The third type is a load balancer, where it provisions a load balancer for our application in supported cloud providers. A good example of that would be to distribute load across the different web servers in your front-end tier. We will now look at each of these in a bit more detail, along with some demos. In this lecture, we will discuss about the node port Kubernetes service. Getting back to node port, a few slides back, we discussed about external access to the application. We said that a service can help us by mapping a port on the node 
to a port on the pod. Let's take a closer look at the service. If you look at it, there are three ports involved. The port on the pod where the actual web server is running is 80. And it is referred to as the target port because that is where the service forwards the request to. The second port is the port on the service itself. It is simply referred to as the port. Remember, these terms are from the viewpoint of the service. The service is in fact like a virtual server inside the node. Inside the cluster, it has its own IP address and that IP address is called the cluster IP of the service. And finally, we have the port on the node itself, which we use to access the web server externally, and that is known as the node port. As you can see, it is set to 30,008. That is because node ports can only be in a valid range, which by default is from 30,000 to 32,767. Let's now look at how to create the service. Just like how we created a deployment replica set or pod in the past, we will use a definition file to create a service. The high level structure of the file remains the same as before we have the API version, kind, metadata, and spec sections. The API version is going to be v1. The kind is of course service. The metadata will have a name and that will be the name of the service. It can have labels, but we don't need that for now. Next, we have spec, and as always, this is the most crucial part of the file, and this is where we will be defining the actual services, and this is the part of a definition file that differs between different objects. Next, we have spec, and as always, this is the most crucial part of the file, as this is where we will be defining the actual services, and this is the part of a definition file that differs between different objects. In the spec section of a service, we have type and ports. The type refers to the type of service we are creating. As discussed before, it could be cluster IP, node port, or load balancer. In this case, since we are creating a node port, we will set it as node port. The next part of a spec is ports. This is where we input information regarding what we discussed on the left side of the screen. The first type of port is the target port, which we will set to 80. The next one is simply port, which is the port on the service object, and we will set that to 80 as well. The third is node port which we will set to 30,008 or any number in the valid range. Remember that out of these, the only mandatory field is port. If you don't provide a target port, it is assumed to be the same as port. And if you don't provide a node port, a free port in the valid range between 30,000 and 32,767 is automatically allocated. Also note that ports is an array, so note the dash under the port section that indicate the first element in the array. You can have multiple such port mappings within a single service. So we have all the information in, but something is really missing. There is nothing here in the definition file that connects the service to the pod. We have simply specified the target port but we didn't mention the target port on which pod. There could be hundreds of other pods with web services running on port 80. So how do we do that? As we did with the replica sets previously and a technique that you will see very often in Kubernetes, we will use labels and selectors to link these together. We know that the pod was created with a label. We need to bring that label into the service definition file. So we have a new property in the specs section and that is called selector, just like in a replica set and deployment uh, definition files. Under the selector, provide a list of labels to identify the pod. 
For this, refer to the pod definition file used to create the pod. Pull the labels from the pod definition file and place it under the selector section. This links the service to the pod. Once done, create the service using the cube control create command and input the service definition file. And there you have the service created. To see the created service, run the cube control get services command that lists the service, the cluster IP and the mapped ports. The type is node port as we created and the port on the node is set to 30,008 because that's the port that we specified in the definition file. We can now use this port to access the web service using curl or a web browser. So curl to 192.168.1.2 which is the IP of the node and then I use the port 30008 to access the web server. So far we talked about a service mapped to a single pod, but that's not the case all the time. What do you do when you have multiple pods? In a production environment, you have multiple instances of your web application running for high availability and load balancing purposes. In this case, we have multiple similar pods running our web application. They all have the same labels with a key app and set to a value of my app. The same label is used as a selector during the creation of the service. So when the service is created, it looks for a matching pod with the label and finds three of them. The service then automatically selects all the three pods as endpoints to forward the external request coming from the user. You don't have to do any additional configuration to make this happen. And if you're wondering what algorithm it uses to balance the load across the three different pods, it uses a random algorithm. Thus, the service acts as a built-in load balancer to distribute load across different pods. And finally, let's look at what happens when the pods are distributed across multiple nodes. In this case, we have the web application on pods on separate nodes in the cluster. When we create a service without us having to do any additional configuration, Kubernetes automatically creates a service that spans across all the nodes in the cluster and maps the target port to the same node port on all the nodes in the cluster. This way, you can access your application using the IP of any node in the cluster and using the same port number, which in this case is 30,008. As you can see, using the IP of any of these nodes and I'm trying to curl to the same port and the same port is made available on all the nodes part of the cluster. To summarize, in any case, whether it be a single pod on a single node, multiple pods on a single node or multiple pods on multiple nodes, the service is created exactly the same without you having to do any additional steps during the service creation. When pods are removed or added, the service is automatically updated, making it highly flexible and adaptive. Once created, you won't typically have to make any additional configuration changes. That's it for this lecture. Head over to the demo and I will see you in the next lecture.